Hello everybody. Welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs, New South Wales, here in Sydney this evening. We are present tonight to hear an address by Anthony Lowenstein about his book, The Palestine Laboratory. It's not exactly a launch because it was launched at Glebe Books back on, I think, the 8th of June. Yeah. Nevertheless, copies are available here tonight at the very special price of $35. And in any case, we're about to hear about Anthony's important themes on the situation, about which you've undoubtedly read, if not in the publications uh, publicity for this meeting, then in today's news. It's an issue that doesn't go away, and I'm going to say no more about it. I'm going to hand over to the expert. Thank you so much for having me. Wow, great to see so many people. I just wanted to start off by acknowledging traditional owners of the land on which we are gathered here tonight and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I want to thank you for the invitation for speaking here tonight. And I was thinking as I was coming here that in some ways this kind of topic, and tell me if I'm wrong, but I suspect it's less likely that we would have had this conversation 5, 10, 15 years ago here. That's not a criticism of the organisation, it's more a reflection of how there's been a shift in some circles towards a greater understanding about what's happening in Palestine, which I'll get to in a minute. And I speak to you tonight, I'm Australian, I'm also German, I'm a dual citizen, and I, I'm not religious, I'm basically atheist. I call myself an atheist Jew, which might sound confusing, but we can discuss that later if you'd like, and also anti-Zionist. And what that means, of course, is a Zionist is someone who believes in the concept of a Jewish state, which could be in many places, but it is now currently, of course, in the Middle East. And I now define myself as someone who's anti-Zionist, who does not believe in the concept of a Jewish state, because by definition it discriminates against non-Jews. And my feeling about that is not that dissimilar, to be honest, to an issue around a Muslim state or a Christian state or any religious state, a Hindu state, for example. Much of this book, which I'll get to in a minute, talks about the current situation in India and its relationships with Israel. And India is increasingly becoming a Hindu fundamentalist state, and I'm equally against that kind of configuration as well. So the issue is not that it's a Jewish state. The issue is it's any religious state, which by definition discriminates against people who are not of that faith, Jewish, Christian, Hindu, whatever you may be. And I've been thinking and writing about Palestine for a long time. If you're Jewish, you really can't avoid it. I grew up in Melbourne. This is not going to be a long potted history, but just a bit of background. I grew up in Melbourne in the 70s, and my family, uh, most of whom were killed in the Holocaust, a sadly typical common Jewish story for those who were living in Europe. The ones who got out, the ones who escaped, came in 1939 to various countries around the world, including here in Australia. And when I was growing up by the 1970s, Israel was something you just supported, you believed in. It wasn't really hugely questioned. Of course, there were people who did. But in general, it was seen as a safe haven. God forbid something happened to the Jews again. For those who don't know in this room, if you are Jewish, you can go to Israel. And assuming you can prove, so to speak, that you are Jewish, which basically means you have a Jewish mother and you were born Jewish or you converted in a certain way, you can be a, a, an Israeli citizen within a handful of months. And of course those same rights are not granted to Palestinians who have, in my view, much greater connection to the land. But nonetheless, I could become, although I'm not, an Israeli citizen. So I've been thinking and talking about these issues for decades. And the book is not principally about my own views. My views are discussed at the beginning of the book to give readers a bit of a sense of who I am and my background. And that was a decision that we, my publish publisher and I decided to have to give a bit of context for what is happening in Palestine today and how there are growing numbers of Jews who are critical of what's happening because it's being done in our name. Israel claims to speak for all Jews. Israel itself through its leadership and others in the Jewish community here regularly says Israel and Zionism and Judaism are the same thing. There is no difference. There's no separation. If you're one you must be the other. And it's true that the majority of Jews probably would call themselves Zionists, that's true, 
But growing numbers of Jews are deeply concerned here and overseas, and this, of course, is in the wider community too, not just Jewish people, about what's happening in Palestine, what's happening today in Palestine, what's been happening for 75 years in Palestine. And I guess the genesis of the book, for me, was I've been visiting Israel-Palestine for 20 years, roughly, since 2005. I've been reporting there every three or four years since then in Israel, Gaza and the West Bank for various outlets here and overseas. And in 2016 to 20, I was living in East Jerusalem with my partner and our young son. And in some ways, I guess I was interested in doing a book or an investigation initially in understanding a conflict that is, as was said in the introduction, in the media all the time, there's very other few conflicts that get as much coverage. The war in Ukraine at the moment obviously does, various other conflicts here and there. But in general, this is an issue which gets covered over and over and over again. I would argue often very badly, which I talk about in the book, but it's covered. And yet too often the conflict is just reported as there's two sides, they both hate each other, why can't they just get along? I'm simplifying it, but that's often what it comes down to. And I was interested in trying to understand and explain why that issue was, well, that framing was wrong, A, and B, to explain that what Israel is doing in Palestine. It's been occupying the West Bank and Gaza for 56 years and East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. It's the longest occupation in modern times. And through those decades, through those decades, Israel has developed a range of tools and technologies to maintain that occupation. What does that mean practically? In the modern age, we're talking about surveillance technology, so-called smart walls, facial recognition technology, biometric data, drones in the modern era. All these tools and technologies that are used to control Palestinians, to divide them. And in the last years, an issue that many in this room will probably have heard of is Pegasus. Pegasus is an Israeli spyware made by a company called NSO Group. And essentially what the spyware does is it allow a government or government department around the world can buy this technology. And it allows them to essentially control your phone. I'm talking about a mobile phone, Android or iPhone. All the contents of your phone can be captured, <laughs> taken, without you knowing. Emails, photos, everything. You can turn your phone off and your camera and microphone can still be used against you. It can record information without you even being aware of it. Now the reason this is relevant, apart from the petrifying concept of surveillance in your pocket, is this idea that this tool has ended up in the hands of some of the worst regimes on the planet, solved by Israel. We're talking about everyone from Saudi Arabia, Rwanda, UAE, parts of the Indian government. There are so many examples of this. And I interview in the book, in fact, a number of individuals who had their phones surveilled. Now, this is not a weapon that kills people, but it's a weapon that profoundly undermines your own belief in the concept of privacy. If you're a journalist, if you're a human rights worker, if you're a human, which hopefully includes most of us here, then these days, for better or worse, your phone is a massive part of your life. Maybe it shouldn't be, but it is. And the idea that all the information on that phone can be taken and used potentially against you is a pretty scary thought. So this got a lot of attention in the last years, as many people here will know. And I was interested in exploring the issue in a much bigger way because Pegasus is but the tip of the iceberg of what Israel's been doing in Palestine for decades. Those tools and technologies often are tested and trialled in Palestine on Palestinians, so-called battle-tested on Palestinians. Now, if you think that sounds unreasonable or crazy or what is he talking about, I would say a few things to that. I guess we might get to that in Q&A. But this is, the idea of battle-testing weapons is not the only thing that Israel does. The US, for example, after 9-11, battle test weapons in Iraq and Afghanistan. They openly say so in the current war in Ukraine going on today. The US and other Western allies are testing weapons in the field. They're saying it, they're promoting it, they're marketing it, they're trialing it there, they're saying it openly. So it's not a secret 
What Israel is doing in Palestine, though, the difference with that is a fundamental one. Israel has had on its doorstep for more than half a century a captured population. A population that is being divided. There are now 5 million Palestinians, roughly, in the West Bank and Gaza. And for much of the last 56 years, although in many ways an occupation of sorts started in 1948 when Israel was founded, Palestinians have not had equal rights. For those who are not aware, if you are a Palestinian living in the West Bank, you are treated as a second-class citizen. You cannot vote in an Israeli election to elect a leader who controls your life. You are controlled by a corrupt Palestinian leadership in the West Bank, the Palestinian Authority, in Gaza, Hamas. And I've spent time with both those organisations, and I can assure you as a reporter, I'm no defender of those corrupt political organisations at all. They're both a disaster for the Palestinian people. But let's not forget the key point. The occupying power is Israel. It's not the Palestinians. The Palestinians are not occupying themselves. They're being occupied by Israel. And another reason I wrote the book, to give a bit of context, is so many global conflicts are about an issue that is happening in a geographically set place. So I've spent a lot of time in the last 20 years reporting on conflicts across the globe, so from Afghanistan to Honduras and elsewhere. And as horrific as those conflicts are, whether it's a a war in Afghanistan or a drug war or gang war in Honduras, they're generally based around geographic borders. What's happening in Palestine is not. What's happening in Palestine is happening within the borders of Palestine, but it's exported around the world. Israel is now the 10th biggest arms dealer in the world. It has sold defense technology to over 130 countries, so the majority of nations in the world, democracies and dictatorships. And I go through in the book, and I won't go into big detail now, but I go through in the book a potted history of the kind of regimes that Israel has assisted and worked with and trained and armed in the last roughly half century. Pretty much every single, the most repressive regimes on the planet. So we're talking about Chile under Pinochet. We're talking about the most repressive regimes in Latin and South America in the 70s and 80s. We're talking about a regime, for example, in Guatemala that was committing genocide against its own indigenous population being armed and trained by Israel. We're talking about apartheid South Africa one of the worst regimes of the last half century, which ended officially in 1994, and one of its key allies for its entire history was Israel. And it was not just a defence relationship. It was partly that, but it was an ideological alignment. And this is why the South Africa-Israel relationship is so central to what's happening now, as much as that regime in South Africa ended decades ago. It was an ideological alignment, and I have lots of information and details and quotes and documents in the book to explain this. Both countries admired what the other were doing to their repressed population. Israel deeply admired what South Africa was doing to its black population, and said so publicly and privately. And South Africa deeply admired what Israel was doing to the Palestinians. They were getting inspiration from each other. Both sides thought they were fighting a war against barbarism. On one side, of course, it was against the black population in South Africa, and in Palestine, of course, it was against Palestinians. And you have in the, I have in the book lots of information to explain what this practically meant and why that's relevant in 2023. And it's relevant because that ideological alignment is now taken on a whole new 21st century reality. South African apartheid is over. That country faces huge problems today. There's an economic apartheid of sorts, to be sure. But officially, apartheid ended in 1994. What is happening today in the 21st century is is Israel has become a key global inspiration of ethno-nationalism today. Now, what does that practically mean? It means that, say, as I talk about a lot in the book, that Israel and India, India is now the world's biggest country with the world's biggest population, the world's biggest self-described democracy, although I would question that, but that's what it claims for itself. 
It is run by a Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, who our Australian Prime Minister seems to be in love with in a deeply embarrassing way. <laughs> deeply embarrassing, but that's mostly the case with our Prime Minister, sadly, these days. Prime Minister Modi is a Hindu fundamentalist. It's pretty uncontroversial to say that. You wouldn't say that in India in front of him because he doesn't hasn't had a press he hasn't had one press conference ever, ever in his entire existence as Prime Minister since 2014. And again, I would say that the Israel-India relationship today is the Israel-South African apartheid relationship of yesterday. And what do I mean by that? Yes, it's a defence relationship. India buys huge amounts of weapons, defence equipment, spyware, so-called smart walls from Israel. That's part of it. But it's much more than that. It's an ideological alignment. Indian officials under Modi, and Modi himself, have talked extensively about deeply admiring what Israel's doing in the West Bank, wanting to do similar things in Kashmir to the Muslim-majority population. So what India is doing in Kashmir in the last years is bringing in huge numbers of Hindus from the south of the country to settle and occupy the Muslim areas of Kashmir. Now, I'm not saying India is doing that solely because of Israel. They're not. But again, a deep ideological alignment. And to me, one of the great threats of this century is ethno-nationalism. One of the great threats today is that issue. And we have the world's biggest country and the world's biggest self-described democracy as a proud ethno-nationalist state. Under Modi, India is proudly talking about becoming a Hindu fundamentalist state. If people question or doubt that, I would urge you to read. There is so much to read and hear about this issue. There is regular pogroms backed by the state against Muslims across India today. This is India. This is not saying it's every single Indian, obviously, but I'm talking about the Indian government under Modi is creating the, the conditions for mass violence against Muslims. And this is the nation that we, as Australia, as the US, as the West, is partnering with. Why? Because they're not China. Now, isn't that a lovely, comforting thought? But it's important to remember that a key friend and ally of India is Israel. And until, right until the end of apartheid South Africa, when the entire world had finally, finally turned against South Africa, which country do you think was with, with them right to the end? I'll give you a guess. Starts with I, ends in L. Israel. And there's a reason for that. There's an ideological alignment. It wasn't just because of arms sales. That was part of it. It wasn't just that. It was up here. It was a belief that what South Africa was doing was right. And if you question that again, there is copious amounts of information, evidence, declassified documents, much of which is in the book, which explains that. And this is the issue today with India and Israel. And India is far more powerful than South Africa under apartheid ever was. And yet there is too much, not just cheerleading in the Australian press and frankly most of the Western press, towards India, but a willful blindness to what is happening in that country. And Israel is a key partner, as is Australia and the US too, of course, in what Modi is trying to do. I want to give a few other examples of where Israeli technology, defence equipment and spyware tested first in Palestine on Palestinians is now ending up. And there are lots of other examples, but let me give you a handful. During, not before, during the Rwandan genocide in 1994, Israel was selling weapons to the regime there. During, both before, during and after the Myanmar genocide against the Rohingya people in the last five years, Israel was selling spyware and defense equipment to the regime in Myanmar. Saudi Arabia has bought spyware and defense equipment from Israel extensively. It was found, Pegasus was found on the phone of Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist who was cut up in the um, Saudi uh, consulate in Istanbul in, I think it was 2018, correct me if I'm wrong. The UAE, huge amounts of defense equipment and spyware, Bangladesh, um, the EU, and this is also something I've talked extensively about, the EU in the last years 
since the so-called migrant surge in 2015, they made the decision they did not want to have that so-called problem again. They're happy to accept white Christian refugees, and let's be clear, in the last years much of Europe has been happy, and I have no problem with this by the way, accepting Ukrainian refugees who clearly are in need after the Russian invasion last year. My issue is not with that. The issue is that Europe has created a so-called fortress Europe, of which Israeli drones, are, let me explain why, are a key part of that. Over the Mediterranean in the last years, you have 24-7 Israeli drones being used by the EU, Frontex, which is the so-called border force of the EU, flying 24-7 above the Mediterranean, the eyes in the sky, watching what is happening on the water, watching huge numbers of boats coming, mostly brown and black and Muslim bodies, and also many Africans, mostly the Middle East, Muslims or Africans and the EU has made a decision unofficially of course to let people drown like that is the policy now they rescue very few people very few people they barely send any rescue boats out anymore there's a handful of NGOs that are trying to rescue people they're clearly massively outnumbered that's the policy to let people drown now I think that's profoundly amoral for a so-called civilised part of the world, but there you go. And the Israeli drones are a key part of that infrastructure. They are watching 24-7 over the Mediterranean, sending all the images of back what they're seeing to Frontex headquarters in Warsaw in Poland. So the Israeli infrastructure is a key part of the EU's border fortress. Their drones are unarmed. They're not shooting people out of the water yet. But to me, this is the, and I talk about this a lot in the book, the border industrial complex is part of what Israel is so good at, and I use that term loosely. Along the US-Mexico border in the last years, you have huge numbers of Israeli surveillance towers dotted all across the border, made by a company called Elbert, which is Israel's leading defence company. Elbert's also involved in Australia too, but along the US-Mexico border, that's a central part of the US border, so-called security. And it's important to note on this issue that this is not particularly a Democrat or Republican issue. There was huge amounts of, in my view, rightly so, fear and anger about what Trump was doing on the border and what Trump was doing everywhere, really. But so much of what I'm talking about on the border has not changed as much as people would like to think with Biden. In fact, much of it remains remarkably similar. Remarkably similar. There's not a sort of trumpeting of building an actual physical wall, as Trump was seemingly obsessed with, but there's a plan to build a high-tech digital wall. Not a physical wall necessarily, but a digital wall. And Israeli tech is part of that. And why would America want that technology? because it was first tested in Palestine. You have Elbert infrastructure across the West Bank and across the Israel-Gaza border. You have a company called Celebrite in Australia. Celebrite is an Israeli so-called security company, but it's most known for phone hacking tool. So around the world you have police departments, governments buying this Celebrite tool that essentially allows anyone to have their phone hacked. If you think that your iPhone or Android is secure, you can, if that makes you sleep at night then that's nice for you, but actually it's very easily hacked, either remotely or physically face to face. Celebrite is purchased by some of the worst regimes in the world. It's being used on by Russia against dissidents. It's being used by China against dissidents and human rights activists. It's being used by China in Hong Kong. It's being used by the Belarusian government, amongst many others. And it's also present here. This is not in the book, but it's research I've done separately. Celebrite has basically been used and purchased by virtually every single Australian government department in the last 10 years, virtually with no conversation, no transparency, no accountability. It's been used by Services Australia against welfare recipients. Some of the reporting that I've been doing in the last few months goes into detail about that, how that's happening, why that's happening. Now, if you haven't heard about that, 
It's because mostly, not a conspiracy, but no one's really reporting on it. And it's that, again, the normalization of surveillance technology is almost complete. There is little, there is growing, I think it's partly explains the success of this book, thankfully, that a lot of people are angry and worried about surveillance. That is for sure. Around the world. Not just Israeli surveillance, but surveillance in general. That we're at a stage in our history as humans that even the possibility of having true privacy is either close to dead or dead. For a range of reasons. Whether it's social media, whether it's phone hacking, for lots of other reasons. But a lot of people are worried about what that means for society moving forward. Are we under constant surveillance? Yes. Do we have much control over that? No. Is there a lot of public discussion about it? Not really. Is there basically bipartisan belief in this in Australia? Absolutely there is. This does not make much of a difference whether Scott Morrison or Anthony Albanese is Prime Minister. It doesn't make much of a difference if Donald Trump or Joe Biden is President. This is the problem. When you have the bipartisan nature of mass surveillance, then you have a problem, in my view. I'm not sure how much more time I have. I can keep talking. Five minutes. Five minutes. Love it. Don't forget you got to sign my book. I will. I'll sign it twice, <laughs> just for you. I mentioned before the reason, one of the reasons I wrote the book was I saw it as a, as a warning. I wanted to make people aware of what's happening, A, but B, as a warning that if we're concerned about the rise of ethno-nationalism globally, which I feel we should be, whether it's in Hungary or Israel or India, then we should also be concerned, in my view, by the rise of the global far right. And it's pretty remarkable and outrageous and shocking that often you have, if you go to far right rallies, which I'm not suggesting you do, but I've gone there for work at times around the world, Australia, US, UK, Europe, you might be surprised to often find the Israeli flag flying at these rallies. Now, to be clear, these are far right groups who are traditionally Nazis. Now, in case you missed the last 100 years of history, Nazis aren't a big fan of Jews. Newsflash. However, however, there is a deep admiration for many in the global far right towards Israel. Not because they like Jews, but because they admire Israel's ethno-nationalist makeup and want to do something remarkably similar in their own countries to create Christian ethno-nationalist realities. I have a quote in the book from Richard Spencer, who's a notorious alt-right so-called leader from a few years ago, and he said, I'm a white Zionist, in his words. And that should scare you, because he's not saying that because he likes Jews. He's saying that he admires what Israel's doing for Jews and wants to do something remarkably similar, in his case, America for Christians and to build a Christian ethno-national state. Now, that you might say that feels like a long way away from America. I would disagree with you. I'm not saying it's about to happen tomorrow or next week. It's not. And nothing is inevitable. History never works that way. But there's a lot of deeply, deeply concerning signs in many countries around the world that either have an election of far-right parties or an admiration of far-right parties or huge amounts of growing public support for far-right parties. And it's pretty clear, as I document in the book, that many of those far-right groups and parties in Europe, including in Spain and Greece and elsewhere, has deep, huge Israeli support. Now, a nation that was born in the ashes of the Holocaust, as Israel clearly was, is essentially openly and happily partnering with far-right groups that traditionally loathe and despise Jews. Now, they would say it's a marriage of convenience, we need to make friends. Okay, but it's an utterly amoral way to see, in my view, the world. And more importantly, 
it's a deeply shameful legacy for the Jewish people in the 21st century. I don't speak as representing Jewish people. I said I'm an atheist Jew, so I'm not... You don't find me at the synagogue many weekends, let me assure you. But to me, the legacy of the Jewish people in the 21st century cannot be or should not be partnering with, supporting, backing, arming, training the worst regimes in the world. Sure, America arms and trains repressive states. So does France, so does Russia, so does the UK. It's not unique to Israel. Absolutely true. The world's biggest arms dealer is America. 40% of the world's arms is, the, is American. But they're the most amoral arms dealer. I know that. And the book talks about that. But Israel's 10th for a tiny country per population. It's a remarkable outcome. And it's pretty incredible when you realise who they've been supporting and arming and training and funding that 75 years after Israel's birth, that to me cannot be the Jewish legacy in the 21st century. Thank you. We now have a good half hour for questions. Um, we invite you to say who you are, but that's not obligatory. Please, though, wait until our councillor, Ralph, with the microphone reaches you before you put your question. So, who's first? Alison, are you with question? Oh, I'm just talking to him, but I'll talk to you. <laughs> well, I noticed that. I'll talk to you, too, if you like. I'll tell you what I was saying to him. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. It's great to hear your work, as always. And, and this is a terrific addition to it. Let's look at where Australia stands on this. It's, uh, the governments have been dragged, kicking and screaming, to recognise the existence of a Palestinian state. And we've only just got away from negative to abstain on this. Where do you think we're going and are we headed in the right direction? With recognising Palestine, you mean? Yep. Well, for those who don't know, obviously the Labor um, Party before the last election pledged that if they won office, they would probably likely maybe endorse Palestine. It was that vague. I mean, it was a policy, but it wasn't, you know, there wasn't a gun to the head of the party. It was they were likely to recognise Palestine if they won. Well, they did win. And my sense is that there is growing pressure i know from elements of the israel lobby and the jewish community on labor to not recognize palestine i mean that's been reported in the press it's not my reporting on that my feeling is the government should do that it's a no-brainer i mean it doesn't change anything by doing so i mean recognizing palestine the question i always have after that is what actually are you recognizing palestine when I say Palestine does not exist, I don't mean to delegitimize Palestinians. I'm saying there is no Palestinian state. So essentially, are you, are you being Australia, are you recognizing the leadership of the Palestinian Authority who nominally lead the West Bank, who are a deeply corrupt, horrible, brutal regime? Is that what we're recognizing? Now, I would argue, as many Palestinian friends of mine will say, who don't like the Palestinian Authority, you're recognising that Palestinians, we exist, we're here, we're a people. And I can, obviously I accept it, of course I accept it, but I understand that logic behind it. I think Australia should do that, but that is the bare minimum that Australia should be doing. I mean, this argument of what Australia should do, if America acted on in some way tomorrow, we would follow five minutes later. I mean, Australia, I never tell you this, Alison, but we do not have an independent foreign policy. I know you know, <laughs> on virtually any issue. And on Israel-Palestine, it's no different. I mean, there are things Australia could do, and it's just following on that point. And I'm not a member of any political party. I, I preface what I'm about to say by saying I'm, no, I'm not a member of any party. But the Greens recently released a new a, a policy on Israel-Palestine. I had nothing to do with that policy. I wasn't involved. I didn't, I didn't write it, nothing like that. But it was acknowledging the reality of what's going on. It acknowledges by saying every single Israeli Jewish human rights organisation, every single Palestinian human rights organisation, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, they were all said in the last years 
that Israel is committing apartheid against Palestinians. It's not my words, it's their words. They're all saying it. So unless they're all lying, or they're all making it up, or they're all smoking amazing something, this is the reality on the ground. And until we acknowledge and recognize that, as the world did decades ago to South African apartheid, the world, after far too long, made a choice about how they were going to treat that country. So in the 21st century, Australia and other countries need to not just acknowledge that reality and stop prattling on, as Albanese does and Penny Wong, about the two-state solution and our settlements are not very helpful. And Okay, everyone knows it's a sham. They know it's a sham but they're not thinking independently. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Can I have an idea? May I have an idea? You're next, but how many people are with question? Okay, Ralph. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anthony. My name's Ralph. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Drew. Thank Very you. Uh, I'd just like you to riff for a minute, perhaps, about um, settler, settler colonialism ethno-nationalism and the uh, forthcoming referendum, yes or no, Australia. In Australia, you mean? Yes, please. Wow, yeah. OK. Uh. I, I, just, I just see that there's some threads that yes. cross there, and maybe you have some interesting comments about it. I mean, I will vote yes. Not that that's particularly relevant to anyone, but I will. Um, I have questions, thoughts, concerns about how it will practically work. Not that my issues are relevant to anyone, but I will vote yes. There's no doubt that there is a connection between many nations that were settled by outsiders. New Zealand, Canada, US, Israel, Australia. They've all, in inverted commas, managed it in different ways, some better than others. Israel hasn't even started that conversation, really. When I say hasn't started the conversation, with very few exceptions in the Israeli public, Israeli media, in the Jewish diaspora, for that matter, although this is changing now, and I'll get to that in a minute, there is not just denial about what happened in 1948, but, I don't know what you call it, obfuscation, just absurd nonsense. I mean, the... You have most of the stuff that we know about what happened in 48, apart from obviously witnesses who went through it, and obviously Palestinians and Palestinian historians, is Israeli historians who about 30 years ago got access to a lot of the archives within Israel and uncovered what was going on in 1948. And it was ethnic cleansing, and there was forced removal of Palestinians, about three-quarters three of a million Palestinians. This is what happened. Now, you can't go back and change that. It happened. But you can acknowledge or at least discuss within Israel itself what you do with that history. How do you acknowledge that? And for those who aren't aware, for many... And this partly, I think, is not dissimilar to how a lot of Jews like myself grew up. Of course, I like to think I've evolved since then. For many Israeli Jews and many Jews in the diaspora, although I said it is changing for younger Jews now, Palestinians are viewed from a young age as a threat. They're a danger to us, being Jews. They will kill us if we don't protect ourselves. And I'm not denying there's been terrorism in Israel. Of course there has been in the last decades. No one can deny that. I talk about that in the book. Against civilians, which personally I abhor. I don't support that whatsoever. But the reality is that until one, as a people, as a community, as a country, humanise the other, so to speak, Palestinians, for the vast majority of Israeli Jews, their connection to Palestinians is as if they serve in the military. So they're soldiers in soldiers' uniforms going around the West Bank. For most Palestinians, their connection to Israel, with some exceptions, is seeing them as soldiers in their villages, in their towns, in their cities. So you can imagine what that relationship is like. Pretty toxic. I mean, you could argue, for example, that most Australians never spend time with Indigenous Australians either. Rarely. There obviously are exceptions, of course, but in general, there's little connection, little time to get, a little understanding of each other's points of view. So 
what gives me a bit of hope on this issue, which I do talk about in the book because it can otherwise seem pretty damn grim, there is a insurgency of sorts within the Jewish communities around the world. And what I mean by that is it's happening here much more in the US and particularly in parts of Europe where you have, in general, a younger Jewish population who are turning against their elders, frankly, about this issue. And what I mean by that practically is that for many, and of course I'm generalising, there are always exceptions to this, but in general, and the, and the public opinion polling bears this out, that in general older Jews have been more supportive of Israel, uncritical of Israel, funding, funding what's happening in Israel or Palestine, uh, pushing politicians to do so, media, etc. And for many young Jews, in the US particularly, England, the UK and here, still a minority, but a growing minority, and by Israel's current far-right government is frankly accelerating these trends, they're turning against Israel, openly, to the point where recently, and I quote this in the book, there was a poll of American Jews, of American Jews, young Jews, who found one quarter of whom thought Israel was an apartheid state. One quarter said Israel was committing ethnic cleansing. This is Jews. Now, I'm not saying all Jews think like that. Of course, they don't. But when you have an Israeli government like you do now, although arguably it's been extremist for 50 years, but particularly in the last six or so months, the current Israeli government, where you have Israeli cabinet ministers openly talking and wanting ethnic cleansing against Palestinians, they're not hiding it. The mask is off. Many people around the world are saying, Jew and non-Jew, sorry, we're supposed to support them? We're supposed to be friends with Israel, the great democracy in the Middle East, when its government is openly supporting pogroms against Palestinians. It's happening constantly in the last six months. This is what we in the West apparently are supposed to support uncritically. Now, yes, Israel's not always its government. It's obviously more nuanced than that. I understand that. But this is the government that exists. And I think that kind of reality is making more and more global citizens, including Jews, not just deeply uncomfortable, but rebelling against the expectation that because I'm Jewish, therefore I must put my head down and support Israel. And on the current trajectory, and I'll leave it up with this point, there was a poll this year, which I quote in the book, of for the first time ever, a majority of, this wasn't just Jews, but general population, of democratic voters in the US supported Palestine far more than Israelis. That's significant. Now, where does that lead politically? Who knows? I mean, Joe Biden is frankly hopeless and almost senile, so who knows where it's going to go? It hasn't reached the levels of president yet. I know that. But there is a real shift going on. And those in the Jewish community who are involved in this issue are petrified of that. They say it, they know it. They know it. They might not say it publicly at forums or in the media, but they know it. They say it privately. They know what's going on because they know that for their brand, so to speak, which is Israel and Israel activism and celebrating the glories of Israeli democracy, having cabinet ministers advocating pogroms is not a great look. Do we have a next question? Richard. <coughs> Hello. That, that's not off. Turn it off, please. Uh, I have another book, by the way. Hello? 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 No. We can hear you. It's okay. All right, I'll just speak others, up. Others can't. <laughs> what, uh, what if, Anthony? There you go. Does it work now? Yeah, that's good. And uh, what if? You talk about young Israelis and they're beginning to react against Netanyahu's disenfranchisement or disempowerment of the Supreme Court. You talk about the deeply corrupt Hamas and Hezbollah leadership of the Palestinians. What if the people woke up to what their leaders are doing among the Palestinians and said, we're not going to send rockets again into Israel, we're just going to and then be beaten around the heads with M16s and by Israeli troops. Is there, do you think, any op 
optimistic view that there might be some kind of settlement that could be reached if the Palestinians stopped attacking and provoking the Israeli counter-offensions, which is always much more powerful than what the Palestinians do. I mean, my response to this will be based more on what public opinion poll is showing in Palestine rather than my particular view. But in the last years, there is a growing support after it had ebbed for a while of actual armed resistance within Palestine. I'm not saying all Palestinians have that view, they don't. And on one level, it makes perfect sense. It doesn't justify it, but it makes perfect sense why you would support that. Do you think if you asked the majority of black South Africans in 1985 they would have supported peaceful resolution? They wouldn't have. They didn't. They supported armed insurrection, which is exactly what the ANC backed. 110%. The ANC was not a peaceful organisation. It was armed. It was violent. Targeting civilians. Again, not justifying it, but that's what the ANC did back in the day. So... To me, I think the, the question, I know you're posing it as what if, but the issue is regularly that we are often in the West being told or asked, where is the Palestinian Mandela? We often, I'm not saying you said that, but we often hear, where's the Palestinian Gandhi who's going to come along and bring their people to liberation? Well, that's a nice thought, but why are we making demands of the people? They're the occupied. I'm not saying there shouldn't be good Palestinian leadership. Don't get me wrong. There should be. Absolutely there should be. But they're the occupied. They're the occupied people. So if we're demanding, we being the West or certain advocates, for a, a more so-called peaceful Palestinian leadership, is there a peaceful Israeli leadership? That's like saying when, for example, the US was fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, that we sort of would say, gee, those Afghans and Iraqis, they're a bit violent against the Americans. It's a bit unfair, isn't it? <laughs> but that's the thing. But that's the same logic, not by you, but the general idea that we see this regularly, that I cannot think of many other occupations in modern times where much of the West and the media, we're asked to feel sympathy for the occupier. Mm. I'm not saying there can't be sympathy for any Israelis. Of course there can be and there should be. But... This idea somehow that we should be far more concerned about the feelings and the hurt of those who are doing the occupying again. Did we see it that way in Iraq and Afghanistan? No. Well, some people might have, but in general we did not. I'm not saying therefore we supported, we being the West supported, those who opposed those wars. We were, you know, behind the Taliban or behind, behind Al-Qaeda. I'm not saying that at all. But there was a degree of understanding in those countries, both within them and globally, that people have the right to resist occupation. Sure. And what's happening in Palestine is occupation and worsening so. So, finally, would I love to see a better Palestinian leadership? Absolutely I would. But firstly, it's, I'm not going to vote on it. I'm not, it's not my right to tell them Palestinians what to do. It's not my place to, to tell an occupied people who to vote for. And by the way, there are no elections in Palestine anyway, mostly because much of the West that backs the Palestinian Authority has no desire to push for them. So when we talk about democracy in Palestine, is it no surprise that most Palestinians increasingly say, hang on a minute, we haven't had elections in years. The West preaches to us about democracy, but they're funding and arming and training the Palestinian Authority, which is repressing us. Sure. We're asking our own questions. <laughs> I am. I love doing that. Yeah. Okay. Another question. There we go. Thank you for the talk. I the phone. Um, and what you uh, you didn't mention uh, where Israeli drew the line with distributing arms. Sort of other ethno-nationalist Russia, perhaps. Uh, is there a line that they draw? Well, they sell to Russia. Don't worry about that. Um, and China. Is there a line? Well, yes, there is. There has been... And obviously this, the industry is very opaque, as you can imagine, as the arms industry normally is. But as far as I'm aware, and I write about this in the book, in the modern age, there are a handful of nations they probably don't sell arms to. Iran, 
Syria, North Korea. And let's not forget, as I discussed in the book quite extensively, before 1979, Israel and Iran were very, very close. Very close. Sold huge amounts of weapons to Iran, trained their repressive police. So to me, although it's hard to imagine now because Iran and Israel could not be further apart today, there's no reason why that couldn't change in years to come. Not tomorrow, but of course it could. So the short answer is, yes, there are some lines, but very few. And as I say in the book, one of the hallmarks of the Israeli arms industry, which again is not unique to Israel, but Israel is obviously a much smaller player than, say, the US, is that they basically will sell weapons or spyware to anybody. And the reason I didn't mention this in my talk, but it's in the book, I very much see the arms industry there as like an insurance policy. There's an awareness in part to the Israeli elite that a lot of the world doesn't like what it's doing in Palestine. doesn't mean those countries are doing much about it. They might put out the occasional press release or I mean it's useless. They're not doing much. But there's an awareness that a lot of countries don't like the occupation. But if you're selling, as a state, so many weapons that those nations need and rely on, you're much less likely to criticise that country in the long run, which I think in the short to medium term bears out. Secondly, on the face of it, you might say, well, one looks at the UN votes on Israel-Palestine, which happen regularly. And on the one side is all the world. And the other side is normally, although not always, US, Israel, Palau, Micronesia, and sometimes dear old Australia. So on, the, on that front, you think, well, the world's totally opposed to Israel. This is, I mean, you know, what, what's, what's going on? It's not true. That's the UN vote. But look at the nations that actually are buying Israeli weapons and spyware and defence equipment and rely increasingly on those weapons to repress their own people. That's what matters. Not that, for example, I should say those defence deals are not partly to try to get UN votes. Israel's often admitted that. Israel knows in many parts of the world it's isolated, diplomatically. But if you can sell a powerful piece of spyware to a repressive state and they may vote a certain way at the UN, why not do it? So the logic goes. But in general, they'll sell to pretty much anybody apart from a handful. We still have time for a few more questions. Just on Israel. Shooting up the mic microphone. All right, it should work. Thank you. I don't think so. Shall I just speak? Shall I I can I can hear. Is there an Israeli model that we could use? <laughs> I can hear. <laughs> I, I'm Jocelyn, I'm a, one of the councillors here. And I'd like to ask you about government legislation about foreign influence, which has been developed in Australia in recent years, uh, though it's claimed that it's not aimed at any particular country. It's clearly aimed at malign Chinese influence in um, universities, mm. in government departments, in uh, research institutions and so on. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, if we, from what I know about the Israeli uh, soft power activities in, in Australia, they have, a, for instance, they fund more visits by parliamentarians than, than, than China or any other country. And they, uh, Duchess, um, and uh, exert influence through the media. And I wondered if you could give, give us some comment about the Israeli foreign influence in Australia. This is not particularly in the book, but it's certainly something I've written a lot about in the last 20 years. And there was a recent study done, in fact, by someone in this room, Sean, who runs an amazing organisation called Open Politics. If you don't know it, you should looking at the role of lobby groups in sending people overseas. It does many other things too, but, but did a report about this a few months ago. And essentially the three countries that politicians were being sent on 
the most were US, Israel, Taiwan, various lobbies that were involved in those kinds of issues. And for those who aren't aware, there's huge amounts of politicians and journalists who, in my view, should not take free trips, but that's just me. They go to Israel all the time. There was a slight lull during COVID for obvious reasons, but in general, huge amounts of... That's how, that's how soft power works, you're right. I've written a lot in the last decades about the Israel lobby. The Israel lobby has a right to exist. Of course it does, like any lobby. But its influence often is one of abusing its right, in my view, in a democracy. What do I mean by that? I mean that there is a constant attempt within the media, I know this because I've reported on it, I know journalists at all media organisations who tell me about it, to try to silence or censor certain points of view, which is not okay. And what I mean by that is, for example, a Palestinian point of view, a more critical Jewish point of view. No, I'm not saying I'm being censored. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm speaking, I've written a book, I'm in the media all the time. This is not about me, although there, having said that, there have been many attempts when my first book came out in 2006, my Israel question, which ended up doing very well, partly because the Israel lobby handled it so hilariously badly that they were trying to literally get the book censored. They were putting pressure on Melbourne University Press that was my then publisher to pulp the book. Just insane absurdity, which failed miserably and it became a bestseller. So thank you very much. But... I think there is a real question, as there is in the US at the moment, I might add, about the issue of foreign influence, that the Israel lobby in Australia has a major role in trying to solidify Australian support for Israel. Now, if your key role as an organisation is to lobby for a foreign state, whether you are for Israel, Russia, China, the US, whoever you may be, I think there does need to be far more accountability about that, A, and B, Clearly, as you rightly said, the foreign influence issue is about we're, we're concerned about the bad states, Russia, China. We don't really seem to care as much about, say, the US and Israel, who also do massive amounts of influence peddling, including within my profession, journalism. And I've wanted for years, but of course with our defamation laws, very difficult to do in Australia, to actually expose who's not just going on free trips, I mean, that's mostly on the public record, but actually potentially working indirectly for the Australian government, US government and Israeli government, indirectly, indirectly, in providing intelligence on, because of their various trips. This is how a lot of journalists worked during the Cold War, very commonly, where journalist X would go to a place that, that a diplomat maybe could not and then feed that information back to a, a local government official in whatever country it may be. And that's not inherently evil necessarily, it's not. But it's pretty problematic to me when it comes from a state like the US or Israel and others, or Russia or China for that matter, that often acts malignly. So if there's going to be a law against foreign influence, which... I suspect with the China hysteria that exists right now, that may well happen. And fi one final point, there's a growing push in the US and the UK, and I think it's only a matter of time before it comes here, in making it apparently illegal for government institutions to potentially boycott Israel. There's a current law being discussed right now in the UK, pushed by the Tories, which may well get through, which essentially says that local governments across <coughs> Britain will not be allowed legally to, for example, not purchase Israeli um, products or whatever it may be, a legitimate non-violent tool called BDS, Boycott <coughs> Divestment Sanctions. I think it's only a matter of time before that's attempted here, either federally or at a state level. Across the US now, there are huge numbers of states that have put these laws into place. I think it's a counterproductive, ridiculous, stupid law that should be broken immediately if it's ever brought in. But it is, I think, a sign of increasing desperation of many advocates of Israel that they realise that you have to somehow make it illegal, illegal to actually implement a non-violent, legitimate political action, which was used very successfully 
against apartheid South Africa decades ago. Thank you, Anthony. Pleasure. We've We've come, we've come to the end of our allocated hour, but some instinct tells me that some of you might want to stay and chat with Anthony and that Anthony won't mind. So please feel free to do that. Um, our next live event here at Glover Cottages will be on Tuesday the 18th of July, where the Consul General of Canada, André Giraud, and uh, a man called Jérôme de Basque, who directs a cultural innovation company here in Australia, We'll talk about the relationship between diplomacy and cultural activities. So do come along and hear that one. In the intervening time, we'll be issuing, as usual, a further edition of, I'm sorry, what's the hint? Membership. No, if anybody wants to buy a book. Ah, yes. <laughs> That's more important than columns but but don't do watch out for our next edition of columns for the time being we're continuing sort of alternating weeks of live events and and putting out our digestive readings so to round off our event this evening uh, i'd like to invite ralph hausko to move a vote of thanks uh well i think I can say on behalf of everyone here that tonight's discussion was uh, very insightful. Um, I certainly learnt a lot. I'm sure a bunch of us certainly learnt a lot and uh, I think it adds a lot of nuance to the discussion and I'm, I'm very glad I heard it and I'm sure we are all too. So I'd like to formally move uh, a vote of thanks by way of applause. <laughs>